the 20th century become century of bloodshed. Now 21st century should be century of dialogue. When we face these problems, we must have realistic, effective method. That's the only way to build sort of peaceful world. All people want to be happy. We all want to avoid suffering. How we do that is, of course, not so easy. The entire culture of Tibet was focused on spiritual practice, on cultivating the inner sciences, the sciences of the mind, the sciences of understanding our emotions, how it is we get from birth to death. The West has a very, very solid understanding of the brain and how it works and so on. But when it comes to the subtleties of the mind, when it comes to understanding the dynamics of the mind, when it comes to understanding the possibilities of human potential in cultivating the mind, the East is far ahead of where the West is now. You know there's an epidemic of depression and anxiety disorders and uh, attention deficit and so on in, in autism and so on in kids, but one of the early fruits of uh, contemplative neuroscience is our understanding that basic fundamental skills of the mind, attention, being able to focus, being able to calm ourselves, being able to put ourselves into a better mood, each of which is a direct antidote for one of these mental disorders, these can be trained, these can be cultivated, these are learned capacities. It's just that our culture in the West hasn't known it and so hasn't tried it. When it comes to the psychosocial stresses, it's not going to be solved by having more material things. They have to be addressed by bringing changes internally. We're at a point in a juncture in history, in global history, where in a, in a way we have almost everything to lose. To not tap the traditions all around the world, it would be foolish. Clearly we need to do something, and we need to do something different than we have been doing. Otherwise, it's looking, unfortunately, ominously like the end may be in sight, coming from one way or the other. There's so much going on now that's potentially negative, but it's also a very potentially positive situation. It really is going to force the leaders of the world and the people of the world to really think outside the box and to perhaps tap other sources of knowledge, other traditions to figure out is there something that is accessible and acceptable globally that's not sort of in a particular religious box or a particular traditions box that actually can change the paradigm of how we're thinking and how we're acting globally so that everybody can benefit and, and actually even survive. I think one of the greatest things we ever did as a country was put man on the moon. There are a lot of people who would disagree with that, but in terms of what our brains can do, what I think we're supposed to do, one of the things is use our brains and our minds to do things like that. Could the Tibetans have put a man on the moon? I suspect not. I think it needed an aggressive culture to do that. But certainly mixing things together, we could probably maybe put a man on the moon and not fight about it, you know, as we're doing it. A few years ago, I founded the Tenzin Gyatso Institute. Tenzin Gyatso is his own Dalai Lama's personal name. It is creating a new generation of scholars and leaders within the Tibetan and Himalayan communities. It will allow them to share the insights of their tradition more completely and deeply in the Western world. The Tenzin Gyatso Scholars Program, what it does is to really bring bright students from these monastic institutions who have already a very strong basis in their classical education, but then they are provided a forum where they can deepen their understanding of the modern society. To think about this journey that started in Tibet, to end up in a monastery studying very rigorously, to be one of the first scholars that's named after the Dalai Lama, to come to one of the best universities in America, Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Our studying here is not for oneself, but we are studying here that we can take more information back to monastery and start it to materialize the vision that His Holiness has to introduce uh, science into mon monastery curriculum. So. Uh, we have a big responsibility on our shoulders <laughs> also. Yeah, I think, you know, Gele learned some slang, so can you, can you, can you speak this? Yeah, so maybe, maybe you can share like this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can share. Yeah, like, okay, yeah. what, what yeah. kind of slang do you learn? Yeah. Uh, uh, pull my leg. <laughs> <laughs> pull my leg? <laughs> oh, oh my God. You've got to be kidding. <laughs> you got it? You've got to be kidding. You've got to be kidding. <laughs> You've got to be careful. <laughs> when they return, 
they will be able to kind of re-engage with their own classical heritage with a greater sophistication and understanding of the modern society so that through this development, later on when they kind of in some sense one could say come to mature in their own right as thinkers and scholars and then they are in a much stronger position to make a significant contribution. What did you feel uh different between the Tibetan medicine and uh, the rest of science. When I was entering into college um, at Stanford, I was really interested in the body um, in extreme conditions. So I wanted to study aerospace medicine. So how the body reacts to weightlessness, how the body reacts to extreme stress. And it seemed like Tibetan medicine actually had a really wonderful way of approaching the body. Mental health is physical health. Physical health is mental health. They're integrally related. And a medical education doesn't necessarily bring all those together in the way that Tibetan medicine does theoretically and practically um, really well. We really lack that contemplative like aspect. They focus a lot on the intellectual development and sitting there and learning facts. But there is this like, critical aspect of self-reflection and placing yourself in relation to an environment and feeling connected and seeing that the interconnections between you and the people around you that I think really promotes ethical behavior and like, cultivating compassion. Back in high school, you're constantly competing with your classmates. A lot of the classes are graded on a curve. If you help even one of your friends and then they do better than you, then you're going to hurt your grade and hurt your chances of getting a job. It sounds pretty different from what you guys are used to. Our way of studying is through debate, you know. So for debating, you need other person very sharp to so improve your own knowledge. If he didn't have knowledge of answering, then it's a you know waste of time. So we tend to help others to catch up, so we have a more lively debate. Once we say it, uh, we are classmates. It's like you know we are brothers, like you know, blood blood related. I'm glad I was your classmate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Particularly when it comes to understanding the impact of mental states or the emotional states on our brain, on our body, the scientific community is able to see a clear connection between cultivation of mental states and changes in the brain that lead to positive health outcomes. Developing greater attention and compassion can really benefit us in our everyday life the inner science of mind, that the Tibetan tradition is very strong and rich. The Western tradition has made tremendous advancement. Our vision is to bridge or bring those two knowledges together, enhancing the quality of life. The timing is just right for these two traditions to really go deeper in enriching each other. The Thetika the Scholars Program is a concrete example of how through a systematic approach, we can be more proactive in this historical process of the two cultures face to face. Its benefit for the wider world may not be so obvious. In the long run, the benefits on the humanity as a whole is going to be very significant. In one way or another, the impact is going to be felt from this encounter, even at the general public level. If you believe that compassion is one of the keys that can help transform our world. If you believe in these ideals of altruism, joy, then we believe that that can actually change the world, that can actually speak to our best selves, that can advance the causes of our shared interests, of our common humanity.